Hello, I'm Cynthia. Um, I'm going to talk about PacMap, which is a new algorithm for dimension reduction. Now, PacMap is an alternative to TSNE, which is a, a really famous algorithm for dimension reduction. And the idea of these dimension reduction algorithms is that you want to take high dimensional data and then project it onto low dimensions and um, try to preserve as much of the high dimensional information as you can. So maybe like the graph structure of the high dimensional data or the local neighborhoods, like who is next to who, um, or the global structure, like where the, the layouts of the clusters are in relation to each other. And um, I got the good fortune to listen to a talk about how to use TSNE effectively by Martin Wattenberg. And I was really surprised because um, what he pointed out was that um, that the hyperparameters of TSNE really matter and they're very hard to set. And of course, there's no ground truth. So the user doesn't actually know what the high dimensional structure of the data are. So if you, if you change the hyperparameter of TSNE, um, these two clusters on the left, which are supposed to be just sort of just two clusters, <laughs> um, end up looking like these kind of wiry, weird uh, objects, or it could look like random noise depending on how you set the hyperparameters. And then another thing that he pointed out was that the cluster sizes in a TSNE plot don't mean anything. So when he um, started with his original data, there were two clusters, a big one and a little one. And then um, when you, again, use different hyperparameters in TSNE, then you get all kinds of weird <laughs> different results. Like again, these weird stringy things. And sometimes the clusters are equal sizes and sometimes there's they, one of them looks like a donut. It's just um, not what I expected from an algorithm that's so kind of, you know, well known and well used. So um, I brought this up to the CMC Interpretable Deep Learning Working Group, which included three brilliant scientists, Ying Fan, Haiyang, and Yaron. Uh, and we worked together to try to derive a new algorithm that would sort of not have these problems. And the new algorithm is called PacMap. And um, so PacMap is uh, soon to appear in JMLR. And, um, I want to just give you a little bit of insight into kind of what PacMap's performance looks like. So let's take the Mammoth data set, which is a three-dimensional data set, and let's try to project it onto two dimensions. So this is like taking the Mammoth and trying to sort of crush it onto the page like a leaf, <laughs> you know, just smushing it onto, onto two dimensions, okay? So we tried this with a bunch of different algorithms. Uh, we tried it with TSNE, which just, uh, like steamrolled the mammoth. <laughs> it's just a disaster. Um, this is us trying different parameter values for TSNE, and it either looks like it's been steamrolled or it looks like a chicken, one of the two. Uh, and then we tried UMAP, which is kind of um, a, a, a later algorithm than TSNE that has um, some other features in it. And this one, unfortunately, as well, has the same problem that the mammoth kind of looks like a chicken. It doesn't really work. Um, LargeViz, again, a new algorithm, uh, which unfortunately has separated parts of the mammoth's legs off and sent them off into the distance and made them look like clusters. Um, TriMap is a more recent algorithm that depends on triplets of points, and this one actually produced what I consider beautiful results. Um, and PacMap's results are very comparable to TriMap's results here, and you can see all the individual ribs, and you can see even the toes on the mammoth's feet, which you can't even see on TriMap's um, results. And it's got like the, you know, it's got the tusks kind of in relation to the feet, kind of in the right location. So it looks pretty good. So let's um, also take a look at how these algorithms perform on the MNIST data set. Now we all know the MNIST data set is, is a handwriting recognition data set um, where, you know, each uh, color here on the plot is a different, um, is a different handwritten number. And we're projecting from a very high dimensional space down to two dimensions. And here you can see these algorithms do what they usually do um, for data sets where local structure is important. So TSNE fills up the space uh, and UMAP actually does a really nice job here kind of separating the, the local clusters. TriMap um, lumps a whole bunch of the clusters together, unfortunately, uh, which could be very disadvantageous if you don't know that these you know, if, if you if, if think about seeing this picture in black and white, for instance, you wouldn't know that these were really separate clusters. And then PacMap also um, kind of does a job that's similar to UMAP in that it really does a nice job um, on capturing the local structure where the local structure is important. And we found this sort of throughout the data sets that we've looked at where PacMap, PacMap can capture local structure when local structure is important 
and it can cap capture global structure when global structure is important. So, um, oh, I forgot to mention one thing. Um, TS and E here uh, split uh, multiple clusters into two clusters. So there was there were two handwritten digits, and I don't know which ones they are, that actually got split apart um, when we did TS and E, which is which is really bad. That that shows that global structure has not been preserved. All right, so here's some more um, kind of interesting results. Uh, I want to just kind of point out uh, the S curve with the whole data set. So that's the data set where global structure is important. And then again, you see here that the algorithms that favor local structure, like ts and -E UMAP and LargeViz, don't do a very good job with this data set, whereas TriMap and PacMap do really well. Um, whereas with, um, with the other data sets that favor local structure, like the USPS data on the top, um, uh, PacMap is performing, again, similar to um, UMAP and LargeViz uh, over there. And uh, the mouse RNA-seq data is really interesting. Um, so the problem with, with looking at the um, ts &E results for that, uh, or the UMAP results for that, is that you might actually think that there are a whole bunch of extra clusters in this data set, when the truth is that probably those clusters are just an artifact of, of ts and uh, uh, the fact that it likes to sort of split data up into these false clusters. And so hopefully you won't spend a lot of extra time trying to do experiments to try to find what those clusters really mean when the truth is that they're not actually there. OK, now the derivation of PacMap comes from an understanding of how dimension reduction algorithms work. Uh, and I'll just tell you very briefly um, a, a little bit of that. I guess I'll refer to the paper um, <laughs> for, for more details on that one. Now, all of the algorithms that I've mentioned so far have a shared form. They are a sum over graph components, and they have a weight on each graph component and a loss on each graph component. And a graph component could be a pair of points, or it could be a triplet of points. It could be sort of really whatever sort of you know subset of the the data that that uh, the algorithm wants to wants to have. The algorithm designers want to have. And we had been playing a lot with different. Um, kind of options for dimension reduction techniques. And what we found was that there are very specific properties of the loss function uh, that the loss function and the weight, um, specifically the loss function, that's really important for preserving local structure, like really trying to get the, like the clusters, local clusters to be separated from each other. Um, whereas the choice of what graph components to sum over really matters in terms of preserving the global structure, like the overall placement of structures relative to each other in the overall um, image. And by varying these things, we were able to really understand what drives these algorithms to work and what makes them sort of not work in, in many cases. So I just want to talk about the loss function just for a very short time. Um, so we looked at the loss functions for ts and -E UMAP and TriMap, and to be honest, it's like reading, it's just very difficult to read. It's just it's really hard to understand. All the functions had different forms and they really didn't seem to be comparable to each other. And we had a very hard time understanding them until we plotted them. And then we realized that there was something, there was a way to plot them that really allowed us to understand um, what were the properties of them that made them work. And so we created um, a, a set of principles that govern good loss functions. And I'm just showing you a figure here, but there's all these principles that are actually laid out in the paper, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, that show you kind of what, what are the properties that make these loss functions really tick. And so because we understood that, we were able to develop a, a very simpler, a very simple loss function for PacMap. It's much simpler than any of the other um, loss functions for TS and UMAP and TriMap. Uh, uh, and it performs um, just as well and, and sometimes better, okay, as you've seen. All right, so PacMap's loss function has three terms in it. It's got a term for neighbors. It's got a term for sort of mid-near pairs, which are sort of farther away neighbors you want to attract. And then it has a loss function for further away points where you want to repulse them, okay? So if two points are close in the high dimensional space, you want to keep them close in the low dimensional space. And if two points are far in the high dimensional space, you want to keep them far away during the projection. 
So um, I can actually write down PacMap's whole objective on this, like the whole algorithm I can write down on this slide very easily. Okay, so let's just take um, the, when I say distance between two points, I'm talking about the Euclidean distance squared in the low dimensional space, and then we added one just so we didn't divide by zero anywhere. Um, and so let me just show you what these, what these terms are, okay? So there's an attractive term for neighbors. So if I and J are close in the high dimensional space, they are attracted to each other um, in, the, um, in the projected space, in the lower dimensional space. And then for the mid-near pairs, it's kind of a lighter attraction. It's like, well, you're a little bit further away from me, but, so I'm gonna pull you close, but I'm not gonna pull you too hard. <laughs> like, you're my friend, but maybe I'll, I'll keep a little distance, you know? <laughs> um, so there's kind of like a mild attractive force for the mid-near pairs. And then for the further points, there's a repulsion because it's like, well, you and me are nothing alike in the high dimensional space, so let's push each other apart. And that's it, that's all the three terms. And then the only thing I have to do left, uh, the only thing I have left to do is to um, tell you what the different weights are. And the weights change on a schedule. Um, so there's three stages of the algorithm. In the first 100 iterations, um, the mid near, the, um, sorry, the neighbor weights is two, the mid near pairs um, weights goes from a thousand to three. So it starts out really strong. Like I wanna really pull in my sort of further friends and then I'll kind of release their grip after a while. And then um, the repulsion force on further pairs is, is one. And then um, it changes a little bit. And this, in the second stage, it really kind of tries to get the neighbors close to each other um, while still maintaining the mid-year pairs and the, further, um, and the further points. And then in the third stage, it basically just kind of fine tunes what's going on that's close, um, close to me. So it, so it really kind of just says, okay, well, let's keep attracting our neighbors and keep repulsing the, the further points. And that's it, that's the, whole, that's the whole thing. That's the whole algorithm. And it just uses the atom optimizer. So it's very efficient. Um, it's very computationally efficient too, which is, which is a really nice thing about it. All right, and so um, if you sort of take a look at how it's doing on MNIST, um, at the very beginning, it's just a random projection. It's just, you know, just garbage. And then after a hundred iterations, it's really sort of figured out kind of vaguely where everything goes. And then in the next hundred iterations, kind of on that second line, it really fine tunes that local structure. Um, and then in stage three, again, it's really just looking at the local structure and making sure the further points are further away. And that's how it produces these beautiful results. Okay, so in the paper, um, we have quantitative results that um, show that PacMap's ability to preserve global structure is similar to that of TriMap. Um, we also show that its local pre structure preservation performance is similar to that of UMAP and TSNE. So TriMap is the best alternative to us in terms of global structure, and UMAP and TSNE are the best um, alternative to PacMap in terms of local structure. And so we're on par with both TriMap's global structure preservation and UMAP and TSNE's local structure preservation. Uh, PacMap's computational time is fantastic. It just really is um, very fast uh, because of how simple it is. Now, we've also shown in the paper that UMAP and TriMap really depend heavily on their initialization for good performance. And we don't think that a DR algorithm should really depend so heavily on its initialization for good performance. It should be able to even have random initialization and have good performance. And luckily, um, because of the way we designed it, PacMap is able to do that. We also showed that TSNE and UMAP are nearsighted. Um, nearsighted means you can see near, but you sort of can't see far. And TSNE and UMAP, they basically just pay attention to the neighbors in the high dimensional space um, and unfortunately lose track of what's a little further away, which is what we claim uh, is the reason why those algorithms are really not good at maintaining global structure. And then finally, um, we, you know, we spent the whole paper sort of explaining um, why these algorithms tick, what makes them work, and that really uh, motivates why PacMap actually performs well, and yet it's still simpler than other techniques. So please go ahead, feel free, um, check out the, the code and um, the paper. I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, let us know, and thanks for listening. <laughs>